Welcome everyone to High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing. Today we have our practical lecture 0 0.1, a short introduction to Unix and uh, SSH tool and protocol. And um, this is something which is a little bit a preparatory lecture for this course. That's why we call it 0 0.1. It's not really totally HPC specific, as you will understand shortly, because Unix and SSH are, of course, a broad topic in uh, computer science in generally. It's just like HPC really make use of Unix and SSH on the HPC machines, and we will see how that actually works. However, of course, we don't provide a complete introduction to this, only those elements which are extremely necessary for your assignments, for the work in the course. And to understand that basically you see the logo your HPC here, you can use your Unix and SSH skill really on all the broad your HPC machines we have in the union. So an interesting practical lecture will show some demos, but before we go into the material of today, let us review what we had the last time. And this was really the prologue of the course. So we talked about the course motivation and the information and we begun to understand the last time that the field of HPC is also, despite being perhaps a niche in the broader field of computation engineering or computer science, it's huge. It's very broad. It covers uh, not only the hardware that you basically have, which you see a little bit here with the systems um, where we had this interesting um, video last time, if you remember, with a kind of uh, second floor with lots of cables, lots of racks, all of these terms we will also define later in the course. So it's lots of technology on the cutting edge of computing, but it's also driven by the needs of domain specific science and engineering applications. And a couple of them we have seen the last time, um, for instance, for example, we had this uh, earth system sciences where, for instance, to understand uh, the water flow in a specific part of the area in the earth, you need to have to understand basically applications in subsurface flow, you have to have a land surface interaction of water, and then they have the larger atmosphere, for example. And this is just something which uh, is one specific domain specific, so to speak, science application in the area of earth science. We have weather forecast um, and many other fields in basically uh, medicine, neuroscience, and you can go on and go on, which actually also are these pillars here that you have. So, however, this course, and this really demonstrates the red part of it, cannot go into all of the different fields, cannot go into all of the different areas of high performance computing. It's an introduction course, so we are limited in the number of lectures. And to react also to basically something which is very popular in industry right now, we provide this year a computational fluid dynamics special. That means there's a large area as a domain specific science and engineering pillar here that is really, uh, you know, driving the needs of HPC. And we have learned that the second half of the course is really then focusing much more than in previous years also on the CFD needs. Computational fluid dynamics is fluid flow, airflow. You see that here also nicely with the car crash simulations of material, the airflow in a car. Um, we have here a very nice way how smoke is ever basically, uh, you know, uh, over time really filling a tube, which is here, of course, a donut as a demonstrator. But still, these are problems where CFD is essential, including also understanding how we flying. So that explains also the logo of the course that we basically will get a more and more understanding how to actually deal with such problems. In engineering, when we want to create something like this, we want to understand, for instance, how here the actually airplane um, really has some turbulence from their um, different ways, how they are basically created. Of course, this has relationships to that turbines that you see here, how they are crafted, the airfoil wings, everything in the aircraft is really something which is a very demanding case for CFD and the demanding in that is really the, the computing needs. And that brings it as one of the nice topics for HPC. Um, and you can take the lessons learned from these lectures 
really to many different application areas. So um, you can have maybe the heat in the room, understand this one, for instance, or understand better how to basically create materials and understand how their behavior over time is reacting to stress. So basically, if you have problems like the car crash, for instance, is a good uh, understanding of the stress of the materials. But this is something which we want to do in the second half of the course. So we start still with a general introduction. And as I promised last time, we really do that from scratch. So hence, today is about Unix and SSH. You see, we have very, very starter topics of HPC, uh, more or less to really get started uh, from the ground. So you don't need any previous knowledge to basically follow this course lectures. And we will always have a review, as you see here now today. Um, with this particular slide, we will always review also what we had the last time and summarize it nicely. Also, students liked that very much in the past. There's one particular element which we should highlight, which is also part of this course. And this is this particular fellow here. For some of you, um, that's maybe already something to recognize from the field of AI. Artificial intelligence is very on vogue. And by today, you can even say cutting edge deep learning of AI. Um, machine learning algorithms, which really scale to a huge machine. Um, these are those which really require HPC to work well. So today you could say uh, deep learning at the cutting edge with really good models is really um, not only a driver of HPC, it needs HPC, um, unless um, you're not swimming in data, maybe with small data sets, then deep learning is maybe not something necessarily for you. Hence, we will also in the course talk a little bit about deep learning. Um, needless to say that the whole course um, uh, basically can be a deep learning course, and it isn't, so it is a HPC course. Uh, in this sense, we keep that, of course, to a couple of lectures and practical lectures to show you that these systems usually are used with um, basically lots of physical sciences, for instance, um, numerical methods based on physical laws which understand then a certain physical phenomena over time, but also more recently also very intensively with deep learning, with AI, and we will also basically show you this in the course. Just as a side remark, because this course is really focused on the high performance computing. And if you remember, we defined this a little bit with having a very good interconnect between the different nodes. There's also a cloud computing and big data course that we will teach in fall, which is a little bit different in focus. You see that here with HPC, we focus on those systems which are very tightly integrated while clouds basically have a different level of access, but also are not these large scale cutting edge computing systems, but rather let's say um, smaller systems um, here and there. So, this brings us more or less to the course organization and content we have walked through. You understood that computing time for all of you, and this is important to understand in the Union, in Europe, um, is basically accessible via HPC systems provided by the Euro HPC joint undertaking. So this is something which will be an orthogonal aspect throughout the course. We will always come back to this point and see to the JU supercomputers and uh, the way how they programmed is very different of sorts. And that's also how this course will start. So we will understand the parallelization philosophy, but based on student feedback, we also want to go quickly, of course, into our assignments and so on. So we have also injected sometimes some practical lectures very early on so that you can start a little bit with your assignments early and get a better understanding and hands on right off from the start. Hence, we will start with something called distributed memory after our introduction. Um, then we will learn basically that you can send messages. We call that power computing. And we will see in this lecture then uh, how that materializes. And then how you basically program uh, a HPC machine with a standard called the message parsing interface. But you can also program these systems um, basically with shared memory programming. There's a standard called OpenMP. And the difference is that instead of sending messages from one process to another, all the different threads in a shared memory program will have access to this so-called shared memory, hence the name, and then being able to read, write, read, write. Of course, there you have to be careful not to overwrite elements and so on. 
Then um, the third part, which then comes after these in the course, have we have learned we will leverage GPUs with deep learning, and we will take up on all of these different basically ways how to program these HPC systems throughout the course in different lectures. Uh, obviously, GPUs will play a big role in deep learning, so we will come back to this also when we have CFD topics, leveraging um, cutting-edge LSTM, long short-term memory networks, or gated recurrent units, grooves, and so on in that course. So we take a lot of lectures, and also Razer gave input on the CFD elements we want to look in. And uh, this would be then also in the second part of the course. And to motivate a little bit the lecture of today, you can see that in one way or another, you always are confronted with Unix if you are basically working on these machines. And also the SSH protocol, the way how you access such a HPC system is in many cases also the SSH system. There are a couple of exceptions. We call them Jupyter Notebooks, for instance, I will also give an introduction to that at some point in time when we need it for deep learning, where you don't need necessarily the SSH, where you don't really need to go on the Unix level. You have a nice, let's say, front end called the Jupyter Hub or the Jupyter Notebook system, uh, which some of you maybe know. It's very familiar from the Google Colab environment, for instance. But that's something which is a little bit different and mostly more tailored really to AI users. Hence, we talk mostly in the AI lectures about that and would like to introduce a Unix and SSH here today. Hence, the benefit is when you do this um, and understand Unix and SSH, you really um, can, can access all the different supercomputers in a way in Europe and also beyond. In a way, you could say that Unix SSH is the de facto standard on all the HPC machines. There might be even some newer ones where that is not the case, some exceptions where containers or Jupyter Notebooks, as I mentioned, might be the most uh, access mechanism used. But still, the majority and the legacy and history of HPC is truly using unique uh, Unix and SSH. Hence, what we learn today will be orthogonal again to every part of our outline. That's also what we did the last time we talked about these outlines. And today, we not really starting with high performance computing yet. Uh, as I said, it's a warm up, uh, mostly because um, this is really a tool set we have to do and have to learn. So today the lectures should be therefore not a complete introduction to Unix, not a complete introduction to SSH. Um, that's not what we can provide in the course. This is a general computer science topic. You will find lots of demonstrations on that. And I will start with the first part of the course really having a discussion briefly about the HPC system and the relationship then to Unix every now and then. Uh, we will discuss different architectures and why that matters when we later log into those. We have different HPC system examples that we look closer, like Deep in Germany or Elia here in Iceland. And then I will provide some you know, selected Unix commands really as a demonstration, um, so to speak here, um, for you to understand what I mean with Unix. Uh, needless to say, it will be not the whole Unix command set of thousands, but rather a couple of useful commands that are basically something we should have and learn in the course here. I will make a small, um, let's say, sidestep then using this Unix environment also to show you the module environment, uh, which is required for software for everything which has different versions when it's the same software, things, tools we need for the applications, and also a basic editor VI. Uh, that I show shortly in the usage, which might be useful also for your assignments. Um, my students at some point in time also use Nano, so there's no need for using the EI. But the benefit is that usually wherever you log in and which HPC system, chances are that the VI is there because it's basically inherently in, in the Unix environments. When we finish the first part, um, we will go over to the second part, to the SSH itself connected to different HPC systems. But before we do that, we want to understand what now this SSH, this secure shell means. We will review some clients that may be useful here in the course to install, like the MobileX term, for instance, and then also understand what such a key pair is, what we always need to basically lock into HPC systems. That is a particular IT security element 
of this HPC systems that you also find in many, many different systems. Um, and if not at all of the systems, maybe some of them are username password protected in an intranet instead of having SSH keys. But usually you would say that the SSH key is a common modus operandi. Hence, I will give you some demonstrations how to use an SSH key with the mobile XTERM on deep and also how you log in actually into our system here in Iceland earlier. So, and here you see the UHPC logo. I would like to take the opportunity here for to say that when we do this and we learn, and I switch here a little bit to the browser now, um, let us review a little bit what this really has an impact. Because you see here on the screen, the different UHPC joint undertaking HPC machines. We will not review that in detail now, but this is something that you can expect. Here's a Lumi HPC system in Finland, right? And we have here a Leonardo HPC system um, in Italy, hosted by Cineca, for instance. And you can go on and go on, Mare Nostrum 5 in Spain. So you see throughout Europe, we have cutting edge HPC machines that are actually available to you. Only what you have to provide is a small application proposal. Um, what you want to do with the system, obviously we are not supporting Bitcoin mining rather than you know scientific software um, applications or um, also more recently also industry applications. So there are also systems for that. And also of course, AI goes all the way either it's engineering, science, or industry applications. Meluxina here in Luxembourg, for instance, is another system. And I bring this example now because you can say that if you log in into these systems um, and you use SSH probably to those systems, then you can also expect there will be Unix and not Windows systems after it. So um, while this is predominantly the case in, in basically your HPC environment. This is also the case internationally. If you go to US, if you go to China, uh, chances are that when you log in there to HPC machine, you will find again Unix, you will find that SSH will help you also to log in there. Again, as I said, there are some you know, particular examples with containers or the Jupyter notebooks where that is not the case, but this is really something useful um, where you can understand that when you learn the skills today, you're ready for accessing essentially a lot of HPC systems around the globe. So let's get started a little bit by now looking at Unix and by reviewing what we learn. learn. Um, this is really use high performance cluster uh, mostly. And that's basically what we want to understand here. But it shows you also how to create them a little bit in the terms of file systems like inodes we will review uh, the, the kind of file system and so on briefly, and HPC environment tools, right? The module environment we will talk about, um, that is really an important part of systems today. Again, many in the union, many uh, of those have really this module environment. There are some examples which are not your HPC systems, for instance, here and there. Um, smaller university clusters may, may be run different areas um, of application environments, but this is something which is also more or less the de facto standard. Hence, fasten your seatbelt and we will start with just reviewing a little bit the understanding again of the HPC system. So that is something what we had in the last course. And important for us is now that these machines are very specific in type. So they are um, sometimes even in former times at a very specific derivative of the Unix. Um, environment or a specific derivative of Linux. Um, there are different installations, of course. What is the operating system on all these different systems? Now, for HPC, that means we have usually an integrated system, which is provided by one vendor and where the operating system is, so to speak, given to you. So if you log in um, and you think, OK, that's the operating system I don't want. I want to install Windows you don't really have a chance to do that or having a Mac environment. So this is something where basically this is an environment given to you, right? And of course, we'll use it with applications as you know already with this tight interconnect. And I brought you a little bit of video to understand a bit more um, nicely provided by our deep research projects. <music> The questions we are trying to answer and the challenges we are facing to solve are more complex than ever.
In today's world, we constantly generate large amounts of data in order to understand the world around us. And we need computing to read and store this data. But the nature of computing is changing, with an increasing number of data-intensive critical applications. By 2020, 25 billion devices will be connected and will generate over 2 zettabytes, 10 to the power of 21 bytes of traffic every year. High-performance computing, called HPC, is also known as supercomputing and involves thousands of processors working in parallel and orchestrated to analyze billions of pieces of data in real time. This means those supercomputers are performing calculations millions of times faster than a normal computer. The next generation of supercomputers, exascale supercomputers, will be performing one million million millions operations per second and are expected to be available around 2022-2023. Areas of application that require such complex and powerful operations are, for example, earth sciences, health sciences, climate and environmental research. In those cases, it is being used to make much more accurate forecasts than available today through simulations and visualization of data. This allows us, for example, to have a better understanding of the processes involved in climate change and to predict the change in our climate more accurately. Who is developing now the concepts and technologies needed to build exascale computers? Among others, a consortium of research centers, universities and industrial partners from eight European countries called Deep Projects. The Julik Supercomputing Center is responsible for the coordination of these projects. The EU is supporting the development of supercomputers in order to stay ahead of the global competition. The main three pillars of supercomputing are the exascale technology, easier access to HPC for all qualified users, further development to knowledge transfer from and to HPC applications. A future with supercomputers is essential to better understand our environment, safeguard our health, maintain our mobility and help industry develop sustainable products in less time. In the digital era, supercomputers are the core of major advances, innovations and a strategic resource for Europe's economic and technology future. The deep projects are contributing to make it happen. So let's let's come back to the talking here. So nice video that also shows you um, how research is developed in the DEEP project. Um, this is important to us because we will use a DEEP cluster in our assignments. One of those clusters mentioned. And you have also seen that 2022, 2023 was the expectation of exascale at that time when the video was made. Um, that's not completely true. We don't have still an exascale system here in Europe. It's way will basically come this year with the Jupiter system, maybe 2025 also, we will, we will see. Just a hint again to the complementary cloud computing big data course that will happen uh, basically in fall where we tackle much more HTC problem, high throughput computing problems where the interconnect is not really very much needed, right? So where the computing can be done, we call that nicely parallel or embarrassingly parallel independent from each other and then just a summary is collected as I was alluding to in the prologue. But let us continue. <clears throat> I wanted to bring you this example again. Um, we talked about this the last time already, but think about that this systems that you see here are already old systems. Um, old, obviously in the laptop you see there with one million flops per second, but also the evolution is really fast. Um, as I said, we have now exascale with 10 to the power of 18 flops. Um, around basically and will soon knock on the door. But the systems you see here have been done in 2009, have been done in 2018. So um, they will appear and disappear, as you see here, end of service in 2018, but come for 2013. Hence, as you remember, this Uton system, I also said uh, it was basically our teaching system. It disappeared after 10 years or so I teach with it. It's now time for the system to end because also the technology in it 
was essentially very old. It was good enough for teaching, not good enough for research, but for teaching good enough, so to speak, to, to really have the, the general principles of MPI programming covered. But this is not a problem, but it shows you a common phenomena that you will see when you are working in the area of HPC. For instance, what you see here, the blue gene series of IBM is even not anymore existing. It was a specific technology brand. And we had a couple of systems in ULIC in the supercomputing system, uh, starting with the blue gene L, Q, and then even a P. But um, that is not only the only aspect of it. Another aspect of it is, which is important to understand, I think, uh, is that it's partly research still, right? Think about the first exascale system in Europe. There are not many. Um, now we have one already existing in the US. Um, but still, how to integrate these systems, these clusters, these racks on this order of scale with the current technology, new um, accelerators, perhaps, it is not at all obvious. So in one way, you would say, it's not really a production IT infrastructure that you can swipe your credit card. It will run from the shelf. And, and it's so simple as buying a laptop. So it's quite different. That's why there are research projects around it, like the deep series of projects that develop the so-called modular supercomputing architecture. This is a word um, and a term that will come again and again. We introduced it last time a little bit, but also should show you that the deep project we use is also a matter of research. And this is, so to speak, always a little bit um, one element really that you need to understand when you are in the area of HPC, that these HPC systems, of course, are used in production on a daily basis. But to go to that status, to really be productive each and single day, keep the uptime of, you know, hopefully 99% all the time, if at all, maybe even a bit less, that's something which is uh, still something to evolve. And here you see the deep partners of the deep pest project that was running um, where we have been part here from the University of Iceland doing some AI applications in the area of large scale HPC. So hence we will use the deep test cluster. And this is not a Euro HPC system. It's a test cluster um, to test new technologies based on the modular supercomputing architecture we discussed the last time. And guess what is the operating system um, that we basically have there on it? It's a interesting, of course, derivative from Unix. So your Unix skills um, is something which you can really use on this deep test class. And that I would also like to show you a little bit with a couple of examples. You see also there are different modules. So I would like to switch a little bit shortly to the Unix website to give you also really hands on. You see here in the Unix website, the deep system. Um, you have this modular supercomputing architecture that I showed you the last time you see. It is a real system. Here's a video if you want. Um, I don't play it right now, but you can see that the system is really existing remotely in Germany. So we also will learn today in the lecture how to actually connect to a system which is not in Iceland, which is not in our university, but remote somewhere in the world. Here are the different configurations. This is very common if you have a system, also the supercomputers of the union of your HPC FCs. Um, when you click through it, you will find the specifications, how many nodes, how many, what are the CPUs inside, how many of them. Uh, GPU technologies, you see here, one NVIDIA V100 um, accelerator, for instance. So these are things which are often basically also given as information. So you see already with these booster module, you would have access to 75 V100 if you want, which is just one part of the system. But yeah, we want to think about a little bit on, on the Unix area. So this is just the motivation that we use this in the course. Another system we use in the course is the Elia system. Um, here we basically have, you, you know, your UGLA, um, where you have your computing services. And when you go to HPC in the UGLA environment for your students, then you will find that you don't have to provide there anymore the kind of, um, you know, forms uh, as we have done in previous years. Here we have a new website, Acquiring Access. And of course, for you students, we will do uh, a kind of uh, group setup, really. So you don't have to really get a kind of account on your own. We will do that for you. But this web page show you very nicely about the LEA usage. And also when you think about the configuration, I was telling you the hardware specifications, what you can expect 
you will basically see here how the system is currently being um, equipped with technologies. And this is all perhaps not completely obvious to you. You see here one A100 GPU, for instance. This will come over the next couple of course lectures. We get a better and better understanding what HPC system is. Hence, today it's really Unix SSH, and I will break off here because otherwise we will lose the focus on Unix. The point is just if you want to walk around in Elia, you also can use your Unix skills. Hence, let's do that. So I'm actually logged in here in this particular way. I will explain you later in the second part of the course, basically to the deep system in Germany. And we can actually test this by using hostname minus R, for instance, where we see here really um, the hostname. So it's not anymore your laptop. Um, you have a specific um, address um, that you can also ping from your laptop and you will see that the deep system, for instance, is also accessible. And we will learn this also in the SSH, so uh, lecture part two. So here let's focus a little bit on what we want to do with um, essentially Unix skills. So one of the things you can use incredibly often is um, firstly maybe the PWD. So where am I in the uh, file structure in the directory structure. You see here the different J users, readle one on deep. And this means print working directory. That's where I am. So that's my home directory. You can always access this also when you do this tilde and you will always be this change directory again in this directory. When you want to have a list, what files are there? And this is important now because many of you maybe are already the generation that just have apps that never really had, you know, engaged in files. You see here different elements of the file system, we call it here are directories. Important might be that one, for instance, here are directories from the different courses we teach over the years, for instance. But there are also different files that you see here, I Python notebooks, and we will come to that later in the course. But you will see basically that belongs all to you. It's in your directory, the home directory. And uh, this gives us an opportunity really to, to shape it. And of course, important is here um, to think about that these files and directories become a lot. So you need to have a good structure of a directory of folders where you put in the files. We can use HPC, course, spring. And you will notice when I use the tab function here, let's say with C, then with tab, you can do this to a completion of course. And then when you do spree, like spring, you will also have the opportunity to finish. So because they all follow the same criteria here. So the tab might be useful in your Unix environment to explore. And when we go to this HPC course in spring last year, we can see, okay, um, there's a test file. And I will make a point later why it's there. But this is a directory and the directory structure I would recommend to also start using when you do your assignment create directories, and then basically you're having a very clean view uh, on this. Now, we want to do obviously the mcar directory um, command and would say we are in a new course. So let's have mkdir course spring and 2024, all right. Now you will see with the ls command that we had before just 2023, you know, but when we see ls minus l, we will see suddenly we have the new directory that we successfully created um, now available. Obviously, when we cd change directory into it, HPC, of course, in, again, using significantly the tab could actually speed up your, uh, you know, coding and your way of using the system very much. Uh, you see it's empty, right? This is also not really a very um, you know, interesting rocket science here, but um, we want to create something. And for this, we use the VI editor. And um, this is something which we also have, of course, in the different lecture parts here. So let's come back just to the slides that you see. What I just presented, essentially, you have that also on the, um, you know, deep system. Of course, we forgot a little bit the who am I. Um, this is Riedel 1. You see that often also encoded here in front. Then elements um, of the module environment we're going to show in a minute. 
um, we have this change directory and make directory folder um, and the working directory. So, and of course the ls minus l command is also very useful. You see all the files, all the directories in this particular um, directory. One interesting thing that I also wanted to show, um, although you know that's a specific element of HPC, perhaps this is the idea of the modules. And let us come to that for a second. The HPC system module environment is essentially for lots of compilers. It's essentially for lots of software um, that is installed. And there's a particular command called module avail that you can use in order to understand what is actually installed on the system. So if you do module avail, chances are it can actually take quite some time um, to get all the systems. And you here see now an, a, a quite nice overview what modules are there available, what software is installed on these machines. And one good example, what many of you may know is Python. Some of you are, might be familiar with statistical computing with R in different versions. So these are systems that you can nicely, um, you know, basically install uh, or that have been already installed for you, and you're just using it with module load, which is the command, then module load, um, you know, for instance, Python, we can go also here and go with the idea of thinking, aha, uh -huh, which Python version we have. And if you do, for instance, here, a double click on it, we can copy it, and then basically being available um, in the, um, should I right click, and being available here. If you use mobile XTERM, we come to this also later that I have, of course, a specific um, SSH client. Now I have this module loaded. Now I can work with Python and we will see how that works when we have later lectures. Of course, for us also in HPC, it would be important to think about, is there a GNU compiler? Uh, is there perhaps also, as I said, we want to have a C program. Are there specific elements? Um, that are basically helping us there. Um, we have the HDF5, for instance, a data file, a parallel file format, if you want a standard that we will discuss also later in the course. So you will see here lots of different um, elements which are really making our life easier. Instead of installing the system uh, software, this has been installed for us. And we can just nicely use that in job scripts, for instance, something that you don't know that will also come in one of the next lectures. Right, so coming back to our idea that, um, and of course this is a little bit documented also on the slides here, so I'll just continue here a little bit also because we are basically almost finished with this little bit of introduction. Um, let us create just a short um, test file and we use a VI for it. It's an editor that is mostly available on all the systems also that have Unix. It's some interesting usability if you want, it takes a bit of time to understand it. For instance, if I press E here, then I insert, um, I'm in the insert mode. So you have kind of a writing mode and then a command mode. Now I'm actually in the writing mode and can say, welcome to our HPC course um, 2024. And when I press escape, then I'm back in the command mode. I've done the text and I can append here and say maybe three of them and make S. But now in the command mode, I can do colon, for instance, you see that here on the bottom and then write and quit. And I'm sure on it, I don't want to question about it. So now we have written it. And when we have this now, this file, um, you we will see that this directory is of course not anymore empty. We have a very tiny test file. We can move this test file and name it in some different, we can say it's Morris file, uh, for instance, and then suddenly we have a Morris file. We can also move it to something which would be, you know, Morris file to Morris file um, in capitals. But then it's important to understand the case sensitivity of Linux and uh, Unix, particularly here, that uh, if I now say VI Morris file, it's not existing, it's empty because we have named it different, right? Even if it's, you know, now basically that uh, there's just this Morris file in capital. So if I do Morris file, then in capital, um, the text is back again, right? So this is something which is also important to understand. It's not the same if you write it in small letters or capital letters, 
This could be even half of it if you say it's Morris file. Oops, sorry, it's Morris file to Morris file. So even if it's like that, um, there could be mixes of this, you know, capital and so on. And don't get confused there. If you now do, of course, Morris file in just small, it's not existing. The same is true if you do Morris file just capital. I think it's very obvious, but I know from some Windows environments and so on, there the system is actually not so str strict with this. But um, when we want to do now this, what we just renamed, then we will find back our text. Interesting is also, although we didn't wrote any text, we have now created these files. Let's remove them with rm. This is a command, of course, and with double click and write, you could again copy this. This is a command, um, obviously, that you should um, use with patience and be careful because you remove the file, obviously. And if it's not empty, then you maybe want to keep it. It's my generally uh, recommendation to you, keep the older files, more or less re rename them. Only if you're absolutely sure in the assignments, remove them. Uh, because it's hard, of course, then to also judge if you really have done your assignment, if you maybe removed it. But I think you're smart enough not to do this. And I think in a way, that's really all I wanted to show you as a little Unix demo here, um, just for warm up to the course. What we didn't have catched so far was really uh, the point that now we want to, to connect to this, right? You have noticed we have been on the deep system, but I didn't show you yet how to go to the system, how to connect to the system remotely. That is part of the second part that we will cover today. So we break here for a small number of minutes. See you next time.